Man, I just thought there was more pastors than people in this place. <laughs> Kept on pastor so and so, pastor so and pastor, and I'm like, my goodness. No, I'm just kidding. Hallelujah. What did you say? Get ready. That's good. Hallelujah. Well, let's. Um, how many of you are filled with the Holy Spirit, and you pray in the Spirit? Okay. Could we do that for just a couple of minutes together? And if you don't, just pray in English and give thanks to God for all the wonderful things he's done and he's doing. Because I just feel that something here that, you know, I'm trying to, 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 to figure out what it is that the Holy Spirit is wanting me to do. So, Father, I just thank you right now in the name of Jesus. Ile to cobra sa catene ne kishi catabre i ketone preva tole keshe. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Father, we bless you. We praise you. Oh, hallelujah, bocele vene nato roshtede. I kite tore beke chare de keshtare. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You know, when I came here this morning, I was planning on minister on something specific. And then as I was sitting there, I just starting to feel something stirring. And it's almost like I felt like God was saying, uh -uh, no, it changed direction. So I hope that's okay with you guys. Even if it's not okay, it's okay with God. So that's fine. <laughs> Amen. But there is something I just felt that the Holy Ghost is wanting me to share this morning, which I believe is going to be something key for all of us at this time that, you know, that we live in. You know, um, one thing that we want and that is necessary, and I'm sure if you've been around Pastor Stephen and Rebecca, you've heard, you know, that we have started and entered into a great awakening. And we've heard about it, you know, the revival, the awakening, you know. But I believe, you know, that we, we have started into that. But there is something every time uh, God wants, you know, is moving and something is stewing and bre brewing that the enemy is going to try to come. And he's going to try to stop or hinder or slow down whatever God wants to do. And one of the things that is necessary, if you look all across and in the book of Acts, when they were experiencing a great revival with signs and wonders and miracles, amen, the spirit being poured and things awesome happening, you know, there, there, there was one conductor, one thing that was enabling this to happen, it was unity. You know, the, the, the church, it says, you know, and you see that again and again, where it said they were one accord, you know, and they even had, went so far as, you know, there was no selfishness. There was not me, mine, and myself. It was like, what can I do to advance the kingdom? Okay, you have a lack, let me meet it. You know, that was the type of heart and spirit that they, 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 they were experiencing and they, they had. And even we even know in the Bible in Psalm 133, you probably all know that Psalm, and I'm going to read it. It says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. For there the Lord com commanded the blessing and life forevermore. And so that is what, you know, when you experience unity, it's like a conductor when it attracts the blessing, the blessing, the blessing, which brings the blessings and the anointing and the favor, I mean, and everything that God is and God has. But, you know, we also understand, amen, that that is that unity because that's where the favor, the anointing, the blessing is, 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 is there when there is unity. Therefore, that's going to be the one thing the devil is going to go after among the brothers. I'm not talking about the world, but among the brothers. And you remember, 
amen, um, what Jesus, when he was talking about the end time, and of course he was talking about the end time back then, then we are in the end of the end time even now. But one thing that Jesus was talking about, he says, beware that in the last days, and he says, many will be offended for the love, the, the lawlessness will abide. The love of many will grow cold. And he says, and many will be offended and betray one another. Amen. And Jesus was warning, but you know what he also said? He said, it is impossible that no offense come. What was he saying? He said, if you think that you're going to go and be in the church and be around people and that no one's going to get offended, you've got something coming. That's pretty much what he was saying. He said, hey, guys, just understand that offense will come. But here is the key. How we deal with it is what's going to determine whether we're going to protect the unity of the brethren and how we're going to be able to enable and, and allow the Spirit of God to flow, to move, the blessing of God to be poured, signs and wonders and miracles. So church, I'm here to tell you, offense will come. And in our life, in every one of our lives, listen to that one verse, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. It's popping a lot. Is there something we can do? I feel like, hallelujah. <laughs> in 2 Timothy 3, 1, it says, but know this, that in the last days, Perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves. That's a big one. We are in a me. We were talking about that this morning. We are in a me generation. It's all about me, myself. It's the self is like on the throne. We even invented selfie sticks and selfies galore. I mean, all day long, that's all we see on, you know, selfies. So you see, people will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers with that self-control, brutal, despisers of good, I mean, so on and so forth. You know, headstrong, ooh, that's a big one, means my way or the highway. Headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, yet denying its power. And then in Luke 17, 1, Jesus said, Hey, guys, it is impossible that no offense should come. And yes, it will come. And it's the, 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 that offense that has the potential to come into the church and break the unity of the brethren. Especially, I mean, here is a church. It's, what, a year and a half? And when it's in its infancy, it's usually at a stage that is yet still fragile. And it's other them the devil would like nothing more but that some of us here or some of you would just get offended and said, forget about it and take off. And now that's why you've heard that there is a lot what we call church hoppers. And church hoppers going from church to church to church to church because... Good, you know, here's the new, there is no perfect church and there is no perfect people, but we only have a perfect God. And so the problem of also with, with, with offense is that when offense comes, the danger, and that's how it destroys the unity, is that when often offense comes in somebody and goes into the heart, Jesus said, hey, offense has the potential to not only just defile the person, but defile many. Yeah. Why? Because you've been around somebody who's been offended and you're around them and that's the first thing they're going to start talking about. But what did you know? No, 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 no. And Jesus says, and he said, that kind of offense has the potential to defile the people around because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. But I want to share this morning about that offense. How 
can we, you and I, be aware of offense and how do we deal with it? And you see, the first thing we have to understand about offense, like I said, it's like it's the trap of the devil. You know, the, the very word offense, it's the Greek word, it's named skandalon. And the word skandalon was actually, it's a Greek word that actually talks about the trap that trappers would use in somewhere South America and, and Africa to trap monkeys. And what they would do, what the trapper would do, he would take a, make a trap out of bamboos. And inside the trap, and you had like bars, and inside the trap, inside there would be a stick. And on that stick, that stick, which was called scandalon, was attached to the cage. And on that stick, they would put bananas. And then what the, the trapper would do, he would put that trap, you know, with a door, and inside the trap there would be a stick, and on the stick there would be bananas, and he would put it right there. And then the, 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 the trapper would go behind and hide. And so what would, all of a sudden he would wait and wait, and then all of a sudden a monkey would come because he would smell the banana. And he would come close and come, <laughs> and then, you know, smart enough not to get into the trap, but what he would do, he would put his hand between the bars of the trap, put his hand to grab the banana. But the banana was attached to the stick, and he would pull, pull, and he couldn't come because he was, the banana was attached to the stick, and the stick was attached to the cage. And all of a sudden, the, 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 the monkey would get so frustrated, you know, focused on that banana, because that's what he wanted. And then sooner or later, what would happen? The trapper would come from behind and hit it on the head and kill it. And you say, Audrey, what does this have to do with me? Well, here is the thing is many Christians today, they are not aware that offense is the trap of the devil to get him trapped and bound, and they grab a hold of the offense, and they are like that monkey. They refuse to let it go. And what happens? The enemy comes, and all of a sudden, they wonder, why is my life falling apart? Why is it that nothing is working out for me? And they go through life with a chip on their shoulder, even sometimes mad at God because all of a sudden nothing is working for me. I can see sister and so she's getting blessed. Brother so and so is getting blessed. Oh, look at them there. and I ask and I pray and nothing is working out for me. Could it be maybe you got a hold of the banana and you're refusing to let it go? And so once we understand that that offense is not just a coincidence, it didn't just happen. It's not just something that just, no, no. It is a strategy from the enemy to trap you and to hold you back and hinder you from walking in the blessing of God. And the first thing that offense will do to you personally is to destroy your testimony. Because you remember what the Bible says, says, they will know, Jesus said, they will know me for the love that you have one for another. But here is the kink, is when you refute, when you are in offense, you're not walking in love. And you remember that verse, that verse in Hebrew, I believe, it's in Hebrew 12, 14, that says, pursue peace with all people and holiness with that which no one will see God. You know, we've read that verse and we thought, well, I've got to pursue peace, so far so good, and holiness. But because if I don't, you know, uh, holiness, if I don't walk in holiness or in peace, God will refuse to see me and talk to me. And God will turn his back on me. That is not what that verse actually means. That verse means that when we don't walk in peace with our brothers and sisters, and when we don't walk in holiness, 
it is impossible for people around us to see God in us. That's the only way that the world we know Jesus is when we walk in that peace with those who have offended us. When we walk in love and holiness, all of a sudden we manifest God. We reflect God and that's attractive to people. But it, here is the thing, when you, we refuse to forgive and walk in offense, not only are people not going to see God in us and we really ruin our testimony, but we cut ourselves from the blessings of God. Now why? Not because God is sitting in heaven, crossing his arm, looking at us and said, hey honey, until you forgive, then I cut you off. It's not like that. That's not the heart of God. That's not how God thinks. That's not who he is. But here you remember in 1 John 3, verse 20 and 21, he says, if your heart does not condemn you, whatever you ask from God, you receive. But here is the thing. When you carry an offense in your heart, anytime your heart will condemn you, your own heart, not God. But your own heart will not allow you to have that assurance, that confidence, that faith to receive what God has already given to his children. That's the reason why, you know, when you look in Mark chapter 11, verse 23 through 25, the verse that Kenneth Hagin wrote. By the way, I did graduate from Ray, my Bible training center, but, you know, in, in the 90s, not when I got saved. I had to go to Bible school again. Apparently, I needed it, you know. <laughs> but in Mark ch chapter 11, verse 22, he says, have faith in God. Then he says, whoever speaks to the mountain, command it to be removed, cast into the sea, does not die in his heart, but believe that whatever he says, he will have whatever he says. And when you stand praying, believe that you receive and you shall have them. And then verse 25 says, and if you have ought against anyone, forgive. Why is that? Because here is the thing, you can exercise authority and speak to the mountain. You can approach the throne of God and receive the blessings of God. But if your heart condemns you, your authority will not work. Your faith will not allow you to receive what God has already done and given. It's not God, it's your heart. That's why people can get so frustrated because when they are in that place of offense, they get frustrated and they can even end up being offended at God. Because they're like, I pray, I beg, I ask, I, you know, and nothing is working for me. What's going on, God? When in reality, they are hindering their own progress. They are hindering the blessings of God in their own life. And not by God's fault or intention or desire, but we short circuit all our own life. Hallelujah. And I remember... You know, I was ministering in Colombia, and I was in a, in, a, in a church that evening, and, and for some reason, you know, God is so good. He will change everything sometime for one person. So it might be just for one person this morning, which God is saying, I love my daughter, or I love my son. I need to touch their heart, and I need them to make a little change. You know, that's how God is. He's good. And so I was in that church in Colombia ministering, and it was, you know, a, a, a quite a big church, and there's a lot. But I saw that lady walking in through the aisle with one of those walkers, you know, and she's pushing, and every step she looked like she was in so much pain. She had arthritis so bad that her fingers were all kinked like this, and she would walk like this and push, and... And then finally she came and sat down. I didn't know the woman, never met her, never seen, didn't know what was going on. But as I just go behind the pulpit and started to minister, all of a sudden I felt like something in my heart and I ministered that message that I'm sharing with you this morning. 
Well, came to find out at the end that that lady as a young bride, uh, you know, as a young married woman with small kids, her husband abandoned her in Colombia and they, you know, there was no social assistance over there, you know, with two little kids and abandoned her to run with another woman. And that woman was so hurt. She was so wounded that she told herself, I will never forgive him as long as that she was so hurt on the inside and she could not forgive her husband. And she told herself, I'll never forgive him as long as I live. He hurt me too deep and too much. And here she's sitting and I'm ministering this message. And all of a sudden she realizes that woman realized that all these years she loved God. She did. She loved God. And she had prayed for healing. People had laid hands on her. She had even prayed and probably fasted. I mean, she for years, and she would never get healed. Nothing was working. And by herself, right there, sitting in that congregation, she made a decision. She realized that that offense was like poison that she was drinking. And you know, that's led me at this, you know, yes, the Bible says, you know, even calls uh, uh, offense poison, bitterness. It says the, the don't be poisoned by bitterness because offense and bitterness is like a poison. And people that refuse to forgive, they have that thinking that if I refuse to forgive you, you know, I'm going to make you pay. But what they don't know is like they're drinking poison, expecting the other person to die. And it doesn't work that way. And so that lady right there, she realized, I've been offended all these years at my husband. And look at me. And with that, nobody knew because she was just a visitor. Nobody knew her. Nobody knew her. But nobody said, and by herself sitting in the chair, even while I was still preaching, she chose to forgive her husband. And all of a sudden, something happened. The anointing of God came upon her, and she found herself totally healed. And then at the end of the service, she ran to the front, and she received the baptism in the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues. You see, all these years, all these years, she felt, you know, she had, she was carrying that. And she wondered, but I prayed, I fast, I, you know, all of that, and it's not working. Why God? And then you can easily get into works of praying more and giving. If I give a thousand dollars in the offering, then God is going to heal me. Or oh, if I do this, then God's going to. When God has gonna already. But what is oftentimes hindering our own advancement, our own blessings of God on our life. Amen. And, and, and the, the miracles and the signs and the wonders and the blessings is that could it be that something in our heart is tying God's hand who so much want to do, to move, to, you know, now I'm going to tell on myself, you know, I remember when I was a young, you know, and sometimes it's not malicious. Sometimes it's just, you know, we can get offended sometimes at God, at the word, at a minister. We can get, and with people, of course, but I remember when I was a young woman, I just got saved. God told me to pack my bag, come to the U.S. I, was, I went to Bible school in Victory Bible Institute. You know, that was the first time uh, I was green. I was like a little heathen that just got saved. And I'm sitting here in Bible school, and, you know, we hearing all those wonderful truths on faith, on healing, on righteousness, on authority, all of the good stuff. And I, there is a young woman, there is a woman there in a wheelchair. She had, um, I don't know 
exactly what she had, but I know all of her fingers. It's like severe arthritis, maybe severe fibromyalgia. I don't know, but I know she was stuck in a wheelchair. She couldn't walk. She probably was paraplegic. And, you know, all of her fingers were like this. And she sat there day after day in Bible school. It was so awesome. And as a young woman, I remember seeing her and thinking, oh, God, why don't you heal her? She needs to be healed. Here we hear about healing. She needs to be he healed. And I remember what that one night, uh, I, I think it was a Saturday night, I had a dream. And in my dream, I saw that woman coming out of the wheelchair. I woke up so excited and then went to church, of course. And Sunday night during service, you know, I'm there worshiping God. And all of a sudden, I had an open vision. And in that open vision, I saw me praying for her to be raised from the dead. And I got excited. And I'm like, you want me to pray for her, Lord? And I got excited. So the next day, Monday morning comes. Here I am ready, prepared, in, you know, in school thinking, oh, man, this is going to be good. And I see that woman here. So I take her, push her to the back away from the spectators we go in the very back and I, and I tell her I had that vision I had that dream I had that vision God's gonna wanna wants to heal you da, 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 da. and she's excited she's like okay and all of a sudden as I start praying the glory of God comes upon it was like that 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 you know when all of a sudden you see like a she can or like a cloud and everything disappears and all you can see is the person in you and everything is disappearing. And I'm in that glory cloud and I'm praying for her. And then I tell her, I said, get out of your chair now in Jesus' name. Now, I didn't know nothing. You know, I didn't know as much as I know now. And so I just said, come out, come out. I didn't help her, didn't jerk her. I just said, come out. And then all of a sudden, and she's like, oh, she was trying and she couldn't. She was trying. And all of a sudden, that thought came. And what are gonna people going to think if she doesn't get healed? You look ridiculous, don't you? And you know what I did? I took one step back and I went, oh, that's right. And the f all of a sudden, whew, the cloud disappeared. And I was left in the cold with that lady in the wheelchair. And I, it bothered me so much. And I asked some people, and I said, you know, what happened there? And I explained the whole thing, and nobody can give me an answer. And for years, I just felt in my heart like God had let me down. I had a dream. I had a vision. I obeyed. I stepped out, and God just let me down. He never did his part of the bargain. That's how I felt. Don't look at me so holy and innocent. <laughs> yes, I knew what the Bible says in Mark 16, you shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So really out of obedience, I would pray for people. And I really didn't really see that much going on. But I would do it out of just plain obedience to the word. But every time I prayed for people, something deep down in my heart would think, well, God kind of let me down that time. Is he going to do it this time? And then one day, as I grew in the Lord and I understood more and I, I, and I saw more and understood more in the word and I got greater revelation, I realized that it was not God that let me down. It was me who let him down. Because I allowed the fear of men to get into my heart. But here is the point that I'm trying to make. Is all these years without even realizing it, I was carrying an offense. It was not intentional. It was not malicious. It was not, you know, anger. It was just a disappointment. Where I felt like, well, God, you let me down. You didn't do what you were supposed to do. And thank God, once I saw that and I realized it wasn't God, it was me who allowed the fear of man to get into my heart. 
And I can tell you, it can be so easy, you know. You can pray for a loved one who has cancer. They don't get healed. You prayed, you begged, you, you know, you did everything you need to do, and that person doesn't get healed. It's easy to get, to get disappointed. It's easy all of a sudden, oh, you can hear, you know, you've been heard by a, a, a faith minister, you know, preaches faith. And then all of a sudden you get offended at the faith message. And you hear anything that has to do with faith, and all of a sudden, there is a wall. Some of you are looking way too innocent. <laughs> Ask me how I know, because I have seen it. Where people that you know so easily can get offended at, a, at the word, at a message, at a person, at God, and offended at themselves. But it all still offends. And it will be a poison in our heart that will not allow us to move forward in God, to receive what he's already given, and to do what God has called us to do. Hallelujah. And you know one thing that I have learned? That that offense is what really will rob you of God's joy and God's peace. And you know how it is when all of a sudden you don't find that peace that you knew. Well, stop and say, okay. What's going on in my heart that I don't have the joy, that joy of my salvation, that joy just to be alive and to love God? And you know, the devil is pretty, pretty smart and cunning. He's mean, he's evil, of course, but he's not stupid. Because he knows exactly. And you know one thing that I have learned? That he will often use the people that are the closest to you. The people that you love the most. The people that, that you trust the most. The people that you honor, that you respect. The people that are in your heart. Because after, I mean, somebody in the street cuts you in from the, the you know, cuts you off. You might get like, you know, a little bit. But then two hours later, you forgot him. But when somebody you love and respect does something and it could feel like betrayal, that's where it hurts. That's where it goes deep, right? Ask me how I know. You know, when I first got married to my husband, I, long story short, you know, I had, God had told me to break up an engagement with a man whom I had falling in love with and whose family absolutely adored me. It was like I had that finally I had sisters and father and mother and nieces and nephew. And, you know, I was just like something I had wanted. And, and then God says, he's not your husband. I had to, you know, obey and cut that engagement. And then when I met my husband and got married to him, I had that expectation my new family, I mean, they're going to fall in love with me. What is not to love, right? <laughs> it was the first thing from the truth. My mother, and that's why there is so many mother-in-law stories, <laughs> I think. <laughs> my mother-in-law did not want me. And not only didn't she want me, but she made sure everybody else in the family felt the same way. And I found myself as a... I got married, I was 36, so I was not that young, but I, you know, I had that expectation because when I left France, God gave me a promise. Whoever left land and family and mothers and sisters will receive a hundredfold in this life. Amen. So I had that expectation. I mean, that's the man that I'm supposed to marry, so obviously, and it wasn't the case. And it was hard because it was like one thing after another. And there's nothing more, you know, it's miserable. You know, you, I, I was used to go on the mission field, right, and, and get persecuted and know people that didn't want to me or hear me or whatever. But then when it's in your own backyard among your family and you find yourself, you know, in that place, it really hurt. And then I knew the word that you love, you forgive, right? 
So I would do that. I would forgive my mother-in-law. I would forgive her. And every, you know, I felt like every time I felt that mm, inside, I would forgive. Lord, forgive her. I forgive her. I love her. But it always felt that mm, on the inside of my heart. I mean, I would hear his voice. Mm. They, she would call on the phone. I would feel. Mm. I would hear her name. I would feel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'd be like crying out to God. Like, Lord, you told me to forgive. I forgive. I chosen to forgive her. But it felt like I could never be free from her. And it was painful. And then I prayed. I said, Lord, I don't understand. I have prayed to forgive her. And I've asked you to bless her. I've prayed for her. I don't why am I still feeling like I'm tormented every day with feeling that. And God told me, he said, I want you to really bless her. He said, Mother's Day is coming up. I want you to throw a Mother's Day party for her that she'll never forget. And I have to tell you the truth. I said, okay, Lord, I'll do that. But for the whole week, I was in the flesh. The whole, I had a flesh fit. And I didn't do it intentionally, but I felt like my flesh didn't want that. My flesh was rebelling, and my poor husband, I would be like, <laughs> Finally, one day, I remember right before that, because I had decided, okay, I'm going to do that. And the plan that was my husband and his brothers were going to take her to church for Mother's Day and then bring her back to the house where I was going to have a huge banquet. I cooked like an awesome French dinner with a cake, balloons, gifts, jewelry. I mean, I went all the way out, you know. And I'm prepared the week, but my flesh is going. <laughs> my poor husband felt it also. And finally, I remember that day, I said, honey, we've got to, I need to talk to you. So we went on the beach. We sat on the beach. And I remember I had to tell him, I said, please forgive me. I had a flesh fit the whole week. And look, some of you are looking at me so innocent. <laughs> I had a flesh fit. I said, please forgive me. I said, I, God, this is what God had told me to do, but my flesh doesn't want to do it. I'm having a heart, but I know I need to do it. So the day when the day came, and it was Sunday, and I had made a beautiful lunch. I had made cock au vin with, I think it was seafood hors d'oeuvres, a carrot, I mean, I went all the way out, make sure, and then I had gift balloons. And the moment she walked in the, through the door and she saw that, she went around, and I went right to her, and took her in my arms. And you know what happened at that moment? It's like something happened in my heart. It's like, shoo, I call it a Holy Ghost razor that cut every root of bitterness, any kind of feeling of anger and whatever else. And I was free. And I took her in my arms, and I, all I could feel was love for her. And I realized that what God was asking me to do, even though it was the harder thing for me to do in the flesh, amen, it was not for her benefit, it was for my benefit. And you know, to protect the unity of the church, we have to realize that, yes, offenses will come. And it's not just going to be a coincidence You've got to be vigilant. You've got to be watchful. You've got to be aware that you are being set up. And at that moment, you've got to have a choice to make. What do I do? Do I just yield to it and fall in the trap and hinder my own growth and hinder my own life? Or do I choose to respond in love? And I believe we need to come to the place where all of a sudden we don't have to do, you know, like I had to do to deal, to ask, and then to, we can just choose not to get offended. And I know for some, some of you are probably thinking, well, I all know that. Yes, we know that, but do we know it to an extent where we are ready for whatever may come? Where we know, because I believe the heat is going up, but with the heat, persecution is coming, 
And with persecution comes the capability of being offended. I mean, we've seen that during COVID, where there's been so many people, you know, COVID this and that and mask and not mask and this and that. And everything that has happened, especially when you tend to want, when you are, you know, a, true, a, lo a lover of truth and you want to share truth and people, all of a sudden, I'm going to unfriend you. And people get offended on the drop of a hat. And we see relationship being broken just because you said something I didn't agree with. What is that? Offense will, will come and many will be offended. And so we have an opportunity in the church to protect the unity of this body, to know that and to choose to walk in that. Amen. Hallelujah. And so what do we do to prepare our heart? Because Jesus says offense will come. Don't fool yourself. It will come. But how do we prepare? How do we guard our heart? First, we've got to be aware of it. That if offense comes, it's a setup from the devil. You are being set up. But in order to come to that place where we do not let offense even become a problem for us and affect our heart and affect how we think, how we feel, what we do, what we say. We've got to protect our own heart from it. How can, how can we do that? By being filled with the Spirit of God. You remember that's the reason why when in Ephesians chapter 5, in verse 15 through 18, when Paul was talking about the last days, he said, be be wise. Do not be unwise, but be wise, for the days are evil. And he says, and do not be filled with wine, which leads to debauchery, but be ye continually filled. And I paraphrase, because that is the thought behind that verse in Greek. It's not just be filled once, which many Christians, that's how they are. They get baptized in the Holy Ghost once, and they think, okay, good enough. No, no, Paul says, be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. How? By speaking in psalms, singing spiritual songs, speaking in the Spirit, praying in the Spirit, worshiping God, singing, even, yes, in your shower, and keeping an attitude of thanksgiving and gratitude. Now, let me add this. You know when? Adam and Eve messed up when they started taking their eyes off God and what God had given them and putting their eyes on the one thing they couldn't have or didn't have. And they became ungrateful. And to be ungrateful and unthankful will breed, will breed that, that lack of, of life in, and, and spirit in, you, in your life. And so we remain grateful, we remain thankful, and we sing, we praise, we worship God. Amen? And in that attitude of being filled with the Spirit, what will happen? Let me show you that verse. You have your Bible? Amen. Now, I forgot mine in Colorado, so they're shipping it to me, but I feel like without a leg. It's weird to be without a Bible. But if you have your, your Bible, look at in Proverbs 23, verse 35. And if you look in the context, it's talking about a guy who's got, who is drinking, who's got too much wine. Amen. And there in that verse here, in verse 35, he said, They have struck me, but I was not hurt. They have beaten me, but I didn't even feel it. When shall I awake that I may have another drink? Here is a, you know, now in my BC days, a little heathen, I have seen my share of drunk people. And you've all heard stories of drunk people that can get beat up. You know, somebody knows they're drunk, they'll beat them up, steal they, you know, their wallet with their credit card and everything, and the guy wakes up, doesn't even know what happened. That's what that verse is talking about. They, I was so drunk that they beat me up. I didn't feel a thing. They kicked me down. 
I didn't even know it. He will walk, he woke up, and all he could think, I just want another drink. The same can be in the spirit, where you're so filled with the spirit, filled with the, the word, filled with the song, filled, filled with the, uh, the spirit, that when you are being persecuted, doesn't affect you. When somebody is doing something really mean to you, you don't feel it. It just goes like a water on a duck's back. It just rolls over. Oh, they didn't know what they were doing. Sounds familiar? Jesus nailed, beat up, ridiculed, spit upon. Father, forgive them. They, I know they don't know what they're doing. Somebody who will do something mean to you and offend you and persecute you is somebody that I don't understand. But we can be above that. And so being in that place of the spirit, and you know here is the key again, that when we choose to respond in that way, to look at the person not as, just look at them like, if I may say, like a victim. They don't know what they're doing. If they do, they wouldn't do that. God, just send laborers on their path. Lord, I bless them. Lord, just reveal yourself to them. Lord, love on them so much that their heart won't, 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 won't help but, you know, to be free. You know, when we can do that, it happened by being filled with the Spirit of God. That's why in Jude, when it says, Be you, my beloved, build yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, the next verse, keeping yourself in the love of God. When you spend time praying in the Spirit, worshiping God, thanking God for all of His goodness, and fixing your eyes on God and not on all, everything else, it causes you to remain in that place of love. That's where we are strong because faith works by love. Knowing the love of God for us, enabling us to love others in that place of love, offense cannot stay. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And you know what it will do? It will turn out as a testimony. When we choose, when somebody does something, so mean, so bad, persecuting you when, you know, or, or and, and sometimes I have to admit that sometimes people get offended for some of the smallest pity things. Pastor didn't say hello to me today. Doesn't he know I went and cleaned the church? Doesn't he know that I've been serving and helping the children first and he didn't walk by me, didn't even say hello. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but some people are like that. And that is revealing a person that doesn't understand how much they are loved by God. And people that are just running on empty in the spirit. Luke 21 Verse 12 and 13, he said, But before all of these, they shall lay hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. But it shall turn out for you as a testimony. If we are being persecuted or somebody is doing, betraying you, doing something that they shouldn't, do to you and and really but you we choose to respond in love and bless them and love on them and pour God love on them and just choose to forgive them it will throw them off and what it will become is a testimony to them you remember Stephen when Stephen got martyred and stoned, right? And Stephen all of a sudden stoned, and I have a feeling that was not a good, you know, a good time. He got stoned, and he's sitting, and all of a sudden he's remembering what Jesus did. That's all I can think. What he saw Jesus emulate is what all of a sudden, because the Bible says he was full of the Spirit and full of faith. Here again. 
And he, he, they stoned him after he shared the truth, a truth that, I may add, offended them so greatly that they became enraged and stoned him. And right there, Stephen just said, Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. But who was there present? Saul was right there holding the coats of the persecutors. He was a witness. He saw. But you know what he saw? He saw a man that only spoke truth in love and that God persecuted, stoned, and killed. He saw that. And yet a man who responded in love, asking God to help and bless the persecutor. Do you know what that did? It became a thorn in Saul's. It became a, how would you call Remember when, when, when Saul was on the road of Damascus? And he's walking, also he sees a great light. He hears a voice. He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He said, who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. It is hard to kick against the pricks. Did you ever wonder what is he talking about? It's hard to kick against the pricks. Let me tell you what a prick is. A prick is something that pokes you and hurts and won't leave you alone, like a thorn under your flesh. And what was it? What was that prick? Was that image that Stephen saw. A man that was stoned and persecuted, but yet responded in love, asking forgiveness, refusing to be offended, refusing to carry offense, and asking God to forgive them. What Paul or Saul saw of that image of a man that was persecuted, that would have had any and every right to say, Lord, I call on judgment upon them, but yet responded in love, became such an image, it became a prick. And I can just imagine that Paul or Saul, day after day, as he's walking, he's doing, he's laying in bed when all the noise is gone, when all the busyness is stopped, and he's laying quiet on his bed, and all he can think about, all he can see is the image of Stephen responding in love. That's the prick. And what did it do? It turned out as a testimony for God and turned a persecutor into one of the greatest lovers of God and one of the greatest men of God. That is the potential of us understanding that offense will come. But how do we respond? Do we choose to be so filled with the Spirit that we remain in the love of God so that when persecution comes, when your family is speaking against you, putting you aside, refusing to invite you for thanksgiving, amen, or when somebody you've done good to, all of a sudden they betray you and stab you in the back when you would have every right to do, God, you deal with them. But yet we say, God, they Obviously, they don't know what they're doing. So I'm going to ask you to help them, to bless them, to cover them, and reveal your love to them in such a way that they're going to turn into a changed man and learn to how to love you. Amen. That is conducive for unity in the church. To create an atmosphere in the church where there is no offense but only love. When people walked in the door, people that are less than perfect, none of us are perfect, but there are people that will walk through the doors with quite a baggage, quite a history, with so much hurt, so much past, so much junk, that they need to walk in this house knowing, feeling, seeing the love of God Seeing the love of the brethren, the love that we have one for another. And they will know him by the love we have one for another. And they will say, that's not a bunch of hypocrites. That's a bunch of people that are really in love with God. But how could you love all the people unless you can know God? You know what I'm talking about? And that has to be. Something we become so aware of that we walk in it and walk by it every day and all through the week until 
we come to that place where the Spirit of God can land. The manifested presence can flow. And there God calls the blessing and the blessings. There God called that anointing, yoke-breaking anointing, burden-removing, that can only be done by the Spirit of God. Not because how great we are or how well we do this or that. And that kind of anointing that they had at the early church is because they understood that. And they walked in it.